Ben Collins is the right dickhead. Thought I might get sued. You swapped your coloured phone for a car yeah. with the dinner lady at school. It was Ferrari versus Lamborghini day. I rolled the winner as he was trying to laugh me. Yeah, they were angry. You took a fake Lamborghini there. Someone drove in the back of me, they cut the roof off, airlifted, paralysed half my body. I put it all on the line. And that's when it all changed. Where's the scale of you as a risk taker? Probably an eight or nine. In the morning, mate, everyone's gonna wake up and no one wanna give a fuck. That is a lot to take. Oh, okay, here we go. I'm gonna break the fucking internet. Cuss. Take it to your maker, baby. Welcome to another episode of Road to Success. Today we have a good friend of mine that I met not that long ago, but still has become a good friend very quickly. Sam Hard, TV presenter, star of his own YouTube channel and a lot more. But I'm going to allow him to explain himself in his own words. So Sam, in your own words, who are you and what do you do? Hello, I'm Sam Hard from Up Garage and uh, I'm a little bit loud, to be honest. <laughs> I'll spend my life being loud and covering it up for a while because I always assumed I was a bit worried about how I came across until you realise that they are your superpowers and you being a bit weird, a bit quirky is the stuff that actually gets you somewhere. And, uh, you know, I've built a career of... I'm a qualified mechanic because I was the youngest Mercedes-Benz qualified mechanic in the world. Um, I've then opened my own business at 20 years old and I've been self-employed for 15 years. Um, I've built cars for SEMA. I've done some crazy stuff that I probably shouldn't even say on camera. And I am now a car salesman as well. So through lockdown, my TV career was cancelled. I signed a deal with Discovery Channel for a TV show in America. That got squashed because of COVID 2019. 20,000? 2019. And um, come back to the UK with a tail between my legs, embarrassed, didn't know what to do. So I opened a car sales. I thought, you know, I could sell ice to Eskimos. I'll have a go at it. And I've done very well. And I now sell 30, 40 cars to sit every single month. I'm nowhere near... The legend of Kelvin's color diary, Binker, he is absolutely amazing and an aspiration. We've done really well, we employ four people now. Um, and we were doing okay, we're ticking the boxes every month and I get to gallivant around the world filming stuff and doing TV presenting on the side. But the car sales is, is the thing that actually puts a roof over my head, which I, I love, you know. And still gallivanting around the world, we actually met at SEMA. We went out as part of the petrol hedonism group yep. that went to SEMA. And it took you three days before you went... Are you that podcast mate? <laughs> even though you just welcomed me with open arms, was not even knowing who the hell I was or whatever. Mm. Same goes, but I've learned that your brand is called Hard Up Garage, and that is everything that you do on YouTube, everything all encompassing. Yeah. Do you want to explain everything about Hard Up Garage and what you do now, so that then we can take the viewers back on how you've got there? Okay, so growing up, my dad, if I could ever be as good a dad to my two boys as he was to me, I know I've made it in life, basically. Like, growing up, they didn't have loads of money, so they could either have a big house and a nice car on the driveway, which, like, 90% of the, the world have, or they could, like, carry on with their dream growing up. So they met each other, they both loved travelling, my mum and dad, and they wanted to travel the world, and then I came along, so it's like, ah, spanner in the works. So do they carry on with their dream and travel the world with the kids, or do they go for the house and settle down, that kind of stuff? So growing up, I've probably been to every continent i've been around the world six holidays a year i've been to india barbados St. lucia spain yugoslavia like when it was yugoslavia obviously and been all around the world and i think the best thing about it is culture you know we we all grow up with people like oh you know he's a traveler he's a plonker or he's a you know there's racist people out there don't like the color of skin well i know that i've been all around this with the world and met every single different person to know there's plonkers everywhere it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is or where you were born or whatever if you're a plonker you're a plonker so growing up that is one of the best things i've ever had is to to travel the world and at eight years old um, i was introduced into the world of racing cars so i had my first mini race car um, my first lap, I rolled the winner as he was trying to lap me. But yeah, <laughs> what a great day. The um, first lap of the, the first, first race. Yeah, so the, no, he was the last rap of the first race. My dad was in the passenger seat. Absolutely. Can I swear? Yeah. Shitting himself. And um, uh, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to look at the camera or you. I don't know what else. Do whatever do you, you want. want. It's all good. Everything, Everything is going to be okay. okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we're on the, on the first race. I'm eight years old. I had a lovely time. And it was white. And it was painted 147 as in maximum break, you know, like on snooker. So I was like, 
And obviously, I turned the car over. My dad put PTO on the bottom. Please turn over if we roll it, which is absolutely fitting for the story. <laughs> and it's the last lap, and you know I'm getting lapped by everyone. And I think the the, the winner was overtaking me on like the final lap. And I just nudged him and rolled him into the bushes. And, and I came across as like the winner. But my dad was like, yeah, we're, we're going to give this a little bit of a, a break for a while and reconvene. So I've been racing cars since eight, um, not was, professionally. Was that in the UK that happened? That was in the UK on like a, a little track, which some people may remember as Horndean SAA racetrack, a little chalk track. And um, I've done bits and pieces growing up. Um, I've always been a bit weird and a bit quirky. Like 13 years old, I swapped a phone for a mini. So I was the first person in my school to have a colour phone, which was quite cool. So I had like the first ever Samsung T100 and all my teachers were jealous. So I swapped my phone with the dinner lady for an Austin mini. So she had a mini in the driveway, like a proper classic mini. And I was like, oh my God, I love it. She's like, oh, you've got a colour phone. I was like, yeah. And at the time... I just swapped it, which is like the most crazy thing ever. I was like, I swapped a mobile phone and all the teachers were jealous of my colour phone. And then I had the Sharp GX10. I don't know if you remember that phone. But basically it was the one that everyone took the photos of like the toilet or a restaurant or whatever like that. It was a big advertising thing. Sam, I was born in 99. He does not know what a Sharp GX10 is. But you were just The story here, just to let everyone go. <laughs> and breathe. You swapped your coloured phone... For a car yeah. with the dinner lady at school. Yeah. And so what age would you have been there? 13. So we've gone from nine, yep. flipping over the guy that was going to yeah, win yeah. a race, to swapping the coloured phone with the dinner lady. I was going to ask one of my questions, at school, were you a confident, outgoing character? But I think that's oh. kind of been summarised and we'd say yes. Oh, no. So, so it's, it's weird. I was a bit of a middle boy, middle man at school. So I was friends with the popular kids, but not popular. And I wasn't, I was also friends with like the, the lower, the geeky kind of nerdy section. I was like a middleman. So I'd be like, you know, trying to sort of wiggle and deal. I was down the back alleyway selling cigarettes for 50 p each or free for a pound, even though I didn't smoke. Like I was pals of everyone. You know, I was like the middleman. I kind of, I was never cool by any means. And like when I'd get home, I'd open the garage, I'd, I'd a mark. So by 14, 15, 15, I had a Ford Escort XR3i convertible. But it had like the, I put the RS Turbo body kit on it and stuff. And I thought it's probably the highest, high, I thought it's probably going to be the highest polished bonnet car in the world. Because I'd assume we lived on the corner of a road and I assumed that if I opened the garage door and didn't have my t-shirt on, I had a six pack back then, back then, not anymore. I would polish the bonnet until some fit bird walked by and pretend that I had a cool car that I drove even though I was 15. So that bonnet had more wax on it than Claudia <laughs> Shipper's ankles, I'm telling you. <laughs> so yeah, so that was that. So I wasn't the coolest guy, but I thought I was pretty cool. But you just said you didn't think you were confident. No, I didn't think I was confident. It but I, sounds I, like potentially yeah. that's incorrect. So I didn't think I was confident and I always had this anxiety my whole life about being... I've always been picked on and bullied at school as well about my skin colour. Like, although I'm not like majorly tanned, like I was always on holiday, so I had a really heavy tan. So instead of Pakistani, they called me Pakistani. <laughs> so it, it's okay. Um, but yeah, there we go. So I was always picked on for my colour. I was always like my hands were always dirty because I was getting home. <laughs> Save you, my friend. There we go. The nickname you never thought would come out of today, did you? But, that's going in there. That there you go. Um, but yeah, growing up, I was always picked on and bullied by some people. And yeah, it, it kind of gives you that anxiety that you're not cool. You, you're not the fun person to be around. Because there's always like the real popular kids, which are sometimes douchebags that always pick on you. And, and you you sort of fit back into, Do you know what? my hand's always dirty. I'm always fixing cars. I'm always doing stuff. But if you think back at school, not everyone at school was car guys. You had mainly football people, mainly Art, mainly like this or whatever, you had a very small amount of people that were into cars. There's probably so probably even less now. Probably even less, you know. And, and talking to people out there, like I had even my best friends growing up aren't car guys at all, you know. But like when you're the only guy at school that loves cars, you just got to try and blend in with other people. Why were you a car guy? My dad, fro fro, used to do banger racing when he was uh, growing up. And he had American cars, and we used to go to my grandma's house and sit in the back alleyway while he'd weld cars up and fix cars. He was a mobile mechanic. And we used to just sit there watching cars. I grew up around cars. Every minute of my life was cars. He used to wheel and deal, selling cars on the driveway. 
and that was everything you know like oh the next one the next one the next one but my earliest memory of a car was with my grandma who's not here anymore um but my dad had a 1982 Pontiac Trans Am, which is a Firebird, which is the same car as Knight Rider. And it was the first car I ever remember in my life. And we went to the Isle of Wight with my grandma in this car. There was no space. It was ridiculous. We had bags on us everywhere. The dog was on the lap or something. It was horrendous. But we took my grandma to the Isle of Wight. And it was the most amazing feeling. And everyone was like, oh my God, it's Night Rider. Oh my God, it's Night Rider. And this day I have a Night Rider car because of that. But that's the reason I love cars is that feeling of, I think that people like to say they don't want to be the center of attention or they don't like to, you know, stand out. But for me, that standing out, being the center of attention thing is the thing that gets my heart racing. And for someone to go, I love your car, man. I was like, oh. Yes, I love it. Yes. And that's obviously translated into everything that you do today, which we'll get on to. And we're going to go through the story of how you got from there to where you've got yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to touch on, because I want to just get this into this podcast. <laughs> well, I've been looking through Sam's channel, because I've watched a lot of his recent content, but I've gone back and looked at other content. And I was wetting myself earlier okay. when I come across a series called Lamborghini. Lamborghini, <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> <Shoot. laughs> A fake Lamborghini merch lager. Am I right into thinking to um, Buckingham? Not Buckingham. Oh, was it? Jesus. No, it, it, was, uh, it, it was. It was one of them. It was Ferrari versus Lamborghini Day. It was it that one? I can't remember. It looked very posh. It, it was a garden party. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you took a fake Lamborghini there. Yeah, they were angry. <laughs> really <laughs> angry, like fuming. Um, but I also did it with a fake Ferrari F40 to a Ferrari versus Lamborghini Day. So I'm. I'm, I'm the guy, you have, honestly, you, you have worked so hard in your career and we all love what you do. And I've seen through the podcast what you've done over the years and, you know, what you've achieved, even to throw in the car up in the, in the pool the other day. Like, it's amazing achievements, all of them. But I've never had a supercar up until now, which I'll get to. But I've always been the guy that loves the looks of a supercar but can't actually afford one. So I've had, like, fake Ferrari F40s, fake Diablos that sold to Shane Lynch from Boyzone, uh, fake Ferrari F40s also sold to Shane Lynch I've had three Mercial Lagos. I'm the only man in the world to have two fake uh, Lycan Hypersports. I have had loads and loads of fake supercars. Basically, that's been my jam. I've got a GT40 at the moment. So that's been my jam. Like, fake it till you make it. So, like, you turn up in a Ferrari F40 at Scott Rattarossa's house and, it, like, at a glance, he's like, nice piece of shit. <laughs> you know, it's about that feeling of, like, I'm still blending in with the cool guys, even though I'm not one, you know? And today, literally when we pulled up on the runway, as I hear a rev outside, I was maybe thinking this. My first moment seeing you, you were in a caterum, soaking wet, just sliding around doing donuts on a random airfield in the middle of Bicester. Not Bicester Heritage, because yeah. that's where we were. <laughs> but as you were there. told him to go to. You just seem like you're always busy. You're always doing stuff. There's always something going on. But to get to that, if you take, if I take it back to... Your school day that you just spoke about, it sounded like you were always there in the moment, just doing things to get by. So did you have any aspirations at school to think, I want to become this, I want to be this, or were you living every day by day? No, I wanted to be, my dad was a mobile mechanic, I wanted to be a mechanic. And my dad did everything in his power to stop me being one. So I was like, oh, you know, so you don't want to be like a hardworking person, you need to be in an office, right? So I went and did a qualification as a Mercedes-Benz mechanic, and... I loved it. I was like, oh, I'm going to go work for Mercedes, whatever. I left school a little bit early, about three months early, got for the apprenticeship at Mercedes. Took it, went back, did my GCSEs, and I was the youngest qualified level four mechanic in Mercedes history in England. So I finished at 19, because I started at 15, with most people start at 16. Um, and then what I did was when I qualified, I said, oh, I'm going to go work in the office and as a service advisor. So like, you know, when you go and drop your car off to be repaired, the first person gives you the keys on the front desk. Everyone's in the garage like, why are you doing this? You're an idiot. I was like, well, no, no, because my vision is I want to learn how to talk to customers. I want to know how to, when the builder walks in and goes, all right, mate, how you doing? I've got my van to drop it, drop off. You're like, yeah, all right, mate, no worries. Give me the keys. I'll get it checked out. And then you get Mr. Like Cunningham. Go, Hello. Sorry to bother you. My name's Mr. Cunningham. Come to drop off my Mercedes. Oh, no worries, sir. Give me a couple of minutes. I'm going to throw a floor mat and seat cover on your car. I'll come straight out. We'll look around it. What a beautiful bit of kit. I wanted to learn how to change from talking to the builder 
to, I wanted to be a social comedian. I wanted to learn how to blend myself into these situations. And also I wanted to learn how the invoice inside of things work because I had a vision that I'm gonna go out for myself. I can't keep working for a company, which at the time I worked for Mercedes. And what I was finding is they charge 120 pound an hour Paying the staff in the garage ten pound an hour and just ripping everyone off. It just did my Did that frighten you? No. The What's that? That you just mentioned. I'm gonna go work for myself. Where does that little mindset come from? You could never the background. Did you just know? And were you ever like worried about doing that? Yeah, hundred percent. Everyone's worried, but on the same end, if your kids are grown up or you don't have kids, if you have a house or you don't have a house, whatever excuses you can make up in your head, get them gone. Right? Don't give. Sorry for this, you have to beep it out, but stop giving a fuck about your insecurities because worst case scenario, at least when you look back, you go, I have a go, I had a go, right? So 20 years old, I on the Monday, I went to work. The boss used to bully me. He was a horrible little short guy, really nasty piece of work. Talked to you like crap, made you feel like shit. You're there early, leave late. Don't like get my job on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. It's getting extended for another 45 minutes. And, um, you know, I had the boss as an arsehole and um, one day, one of the guys, the, the customers coming, I got in with him really, really well. He's like, oh, the injectors are gone on my on my, my van. And I'm like, cool. Well, I know how to do that. And man, I'll do it for 500 quid after work if you want. He's like, yeah, right. So I went out on, this is like the Monday. I worked through the night, didn't even go home. And I fixed this car, went home, had a shower, went back to work 7 a.m., had him a notice in and finished at 5 o'clock and bought my first Renault Clio van for 500 quid, yeah? And I put some stickers on it saying elite vehicle maintenance. And I went out working in the back of a van for as a mobile mechanic. The first day I was like, Joe, what's the worst going to happen? I'm going to find another job with a boss that's just as much of an arsehole. Yeah. And I went out on my own. I thought, well, I'm renting a room at my mate's house. I don't have any kids. Like, the money isn't really going anywhere anyway. Every penny that comes in goes out. I'm not getting anywhere. This 500 quid I've earned in 24 hours is more money than I earn in a week working here anyway. So why don't I just have a go? So then he's like, I've got three other vans that need a service. Bang, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I've never looked back. I'm now 35 years old. Sorry, I keep... His, his, his water is very wet. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so it's just been that thing of like, have a go. Worst case scenario, I'll find a job. I'm a qualified mechanic. It'll be fine. And, and the most important thing and piece of advice I'll give anyone, right, is we need to be comedians in our job roles as well. Years ago, you're a bricklayer. You're a bricklayer for your career. Yeah. Nowadays, you're a bricklayer, brilliant. You watch Carpenter, you muck in for an hour and here and help out. Do you know what? I'm actually all right at that. Someone else goes, I've got a bit of evening work. Do you want to do some carpentry work? 50, 100 quid. Cool. You jump on that bandwagon. Do you want a job as a carpenter? You're actually pretty good. Cool. Bang. Always keep adding to your portfolio. Never ever be stuck in a way that, do you know what? I'm a, I'm a receptionist. That's all I can do. Cool. Go and do an accounting course on freaking online. Go and learn how an accounting system works. Go and work out. How? Go buy an old car bonnet from the scrapyard, sand it down, learn how to paint it, learn how to repair a bike tile in your, in your mountain bike, learn how to replace a chain on your lawnmower, like a, a blade on your lawnmower. There's a job that everyone can do. No one started off knowing what they were doing, and no age is too late, ever. The best time to plant a tree is either 20 years ago or now. 100%. What I found really fascinating there about somewhere that I'm going to go with your, your story is... You mentioned about how you would interact with different people that walk through the door of that dealership. And there was just something in you that wanted to learn how to speak to those different people. Yep. We were at uh, SEMA, again, with patriotism, yep. like we mentioned before. But I can't get into words for the viewers uh, listening to this, just how huge SEMA is. It, it's a city compared to anything else of automotive. Yeah. There. It's massive. And we're walking around with some really well-known people with huge following some of which have had on the podcast yeah. matt armstrong tavarish and you'd expect every five minutes them to be being recognized or known they, they kind of were yeah but no more so than sam yeah you know, who in just terms of numbers online doesn't have the same kind of levels of following no. what i found amazing is you just knew everybody yeah. and your network is far beyond anybody's i've ever seen in the yeah. automotive space and then when I hear about your story and where you come from, like how we've got to this van with the stickers on the yeah. side, I think, how does that guy go from there to walking around SEMA with Richard Rawlings biting That's his nice. nipples and up. Yeah, yeah. Space, to hosting the car vertical party on the Monday night where you had TV stars turning up? Everybody came. How does that go? Obviously, there's a link back to that Mercedes when people walk through and learning how to speak to people. 
But what has building that network done for you and why is knowing people so important? So, so networking is the weirdest thing in the world, right? I have learned, so back in, where was I? So nine years ago, I hated my life. I had the most amazing, beautiful lady. So let's, let's go back a little bit further. 13 years ago, I was driving a Mercedes down the road on the motorway and there was a big accident, so I slowed down and stopped. So someone drove in the back of me at 60 mile an hour. I lived in a flat, my little baby boy had just been born. Um, and so my missus was pregnant and I had a, a house, a flat we were renting, you know? Starting off, small garage, couple of employees, it was all going all right. Someone drove in the back of me, they cut the roof off, airlifted, paralyzed half my body, couldn't feel anything. It wasn't my spine, it was my head had just basically shut down. I don't know what happened, but I couldn't feel half my body, right? I was in hospital for, for like over a month and our savings at home, it was always like the staff get paid before I do, that's, that's any business. Um, if you don't have staff, don't have business, game over, you can't worry about your future. But all our savings went to paying their wages for like a course of months. So the point where I was completely screwed. I've got no money left. I'm like, I can't afford the rent. My kid's about to be born. And I'm like a little girl on a playground crying her eyes out. Do you know what I mean? Boys cry too, but like, um, I'm devastated. What am I going to do? So I went to the council and I'm like, look, I'm screwed. I've paid two months rent. I've got a notice of 30 days. Have no money in the bank. Here's a hospital report. I've been in an accident. I've got my own business. I'm self-employed. I've got no money left. I'm screwed. And they were like, do you know what, Mr. Hard? This is what the system's for. People like you is not feel that don't want to work. You've paid your taxes the whole life. You've always done this. You've done that. You've kept up with everything you've ever done, right? This is what the system's for. So I went in assisted living. So we're in a hotel for six months. Then we were in a flat, then an apartment, then a housing association place. And over the years, I've swapped up and swapped up, finally to get a two-bedroom house, yeah? Where was I starting with this? Where was I going with this? Accident. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so... You got into the two-bed house after going yeah. through all of that crap. So all, all the crap happened, but then the business always stayed there, always supported the family, and then, like, it was about... Like a little lifeline. Like a little lifeline that sort of paid the bills, kept the roof over the head. It wasn't about making money. I don't care about money. Money will come when all the rest of the stars align. You know, that shit is printed every day. Friendships and your reputation is saying you'll never get back, right? So concentrate on them in life. Money will come later, right? So... We're like nine years ago, I hate life. I'm fixing cars in the pouring rain. Technology, you're always chasing it. There's no point, three grand for a bit of equipment. Two years later, it's another three grand. You can't can, can keep doing it as a, as a mobile or a small garage. And um, my dad was like, look, I don't know how long I'm gonna be around left. My grandma passed away. Do you wanna to come to El Paso, Texas for me? And we'll buy a car and we'll drive across America, father and son. I was like, do you know what? Let's do it, it's amazing. So we flew out to El Paso, Texas. And we jumped to this little garage in the middle of nowhere. And this is like on the border of Juarez, the most dangerous town in the world, right? Scary as hell. We meet this guy, start with the friends, like, where's the bar? Let's go get fucked up. You know, like, as a young man does, right? And um, I was, he's like, what's your, what's your plan, guys? Like, we're going to buy his Cadillac and we're going to drive all the way to Richard Rollins. I want to meet Richard because every Monday at my work, we projected Gas Monkey on the wall. And it was like, Monday's always the worst day of the week. So why don't you start with a positive and some fun? So you always have a, a few cans of drink, Coke or whatever, and some breakfast and watch Gas Monkey, right? And then I was like, I'm going to go meet Richard Rawlins. So the guy's like, I know him. I was like, bullshit. What do you mean bullshit? I was like, there's no way. We're in El Paso, Texas. You're in Dallas, the other side of the country. It's like being in freaking Spain and going, oh yeah, I know him, mate. Don't worry about it. He's like, so he gets his phone out. And most people that hide what they do or where they know someone's like, yeah, I'll phone him for you. And they're like, yeah, he didn't pick up. Sorry. He's on last week there. So, yo, what's up? So, hey, man. I'm like, oh, my God, it's Richard Rawlins on the phone. I'm like sliding off my seat with excitement. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's him. He's like, I've got a friend of mine called Sam Ard. Wants to meet you. I flew out, become friends with Richard. Yeah. And it was like, I turned up at nine in the morning, like, eager beaver, I'm going to meet Richard. I'm going to meet Richard. Oh, I'm so excited because the only reason I lived every day and fixed cars because he fixed cars. And I thought, like, he's the coolest guy. He's always got the girls. He's all got a beer in his hand. His hair is majestic, and he's minted as fuck, yeah? It's what? That little bastard polishing the front of his car on the corner of that house all those years ago yeah, yeah. was aiming to be. I said, I want to be that guy. And um, I went in to meet him, and he wasn't there. I was like, fuck, I've just spent my last money on my credit card to meet him. I rent in a rental car, which I crash later. Um, and I'll get to that later. And I turned up, 9 o'clock in the morning. He's like, he's not here. He won't be back till 7 o'clock at night. I was like, cool. So... 
help stock the shelves. Like the, the girls were getting t-shirts out. They were cleaning the windows, cleaning the windows, sweeping the yard, just mucking in for the day. Like the day-to-day -day stuff was the front of the shop, you know? And they were cleaning the windows, they were moving the cars. I was just mucking in. I was like, oh, I'm waiting for Richard. He knows I'm coming. Seven o'clock at night, I am like shattered, right? Done that. This, this young, I had a lovely lady and kids at home, so I don't mess around. But the, the staff in the shop were hitting on me. Like, if Richard don't turn up, do you want to come out and get messed up i'm like oh we can do but got a wife and kids i don't mess around whatever we'll get to that later on as well <laughs> but he, he, um richard turns up he's like, oh you're right mate nice to meet you i was like yeah you do a photo and i was like yeah i'm friends with michael lightball out of el paso he's like oh shit door opened up yeah so that networking of me going to el paso to meet that guy got me not to take a photo of richard as a fanboy that got me behind the door yeah and then the night i was like do you know what? He drinks Miller Light. It's a fridge full of Miller Light. Bang, 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 tequila. And I'm like, out of my nut, drunk. Me and Richard. Richard's out of his head, like, we're dancing around the shop where he's on the phone. He's got a ghetto blast. There's photos, like, I'll oh, send to you. Unbelievable. And, like, the most, doing shots of him, like, the most amazing night of my life that like, I've ever dreamed of, yeah? And I'm like, can I uh, give you my number? Just in case. He said, no, no, take mine. And at that point, I realised that networking isn't about Hi mate, my name's Sam, I do this, this and this, this and this and this, this is me, me, me. Can I get your number? It's not about that. Go and have some fun with these people. Become pals with them. Do stuff that they're not used to. Like everyone around them wants to be, oh hi Richard, I love what you do. Stop being that person. You're a car mechanic, you're a business owner, you're on the same level. We all shit and piss the same way. Blend in, yeah? At that point he was like, there's my number, right? So straight away, shit in hell, I've got Richard Rawlings' number. So then, over the last eight, nine years, we've become mates to the point where text him, brilliant video, mate, keep smashing it. He'll be like, you too, mate, you bloody legend, doing this. And we bounce off each other, right? And I, up until 2021, said he was, I never, ever called him a friend. Yeah, so I, I think he's amazing. I love him. I'd love to call him as a friend, but he's never caught class me as a friend. So I'm like, he's someone I know. I'm happy to know him. I've got his number with business associates, whatever, right? And then Petroidism Live turned up. And sorry, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a That's tangent here. But there was a show called Buster Land Car Show, right? And there was a guy that I used to work with called Beep, because I'm not going to give him the satisfaction of having his name. But he was a bully and a horrible person. And I signed the contract again with another TV production company in England for my own show. And they were like, he would be the salesman and it would be my garage. So he would be a salesman. And it was a gas monkey-esque feeling, yeah? And he turned around and went, oh yeah, well I want 50% of the heart of garage. And I went, no. So I walked away from the TV show because he wanted too much of the pie, right? But then he flew out to Miami with Elo, who we obviously met, and has had some publicity at the moment, at owned the London Motor Museum, and filmed with Richard and Elo in Miami. I was jealous. It ate away at me like a little, the little green monster attack me like Richard who I've been trying to who I've known for years is there holding him like he's trying to like pal up with him and take photos and he's doing all the stuff I wanted to do and I was gutted I was in I had this little bubble in my chest of feeling sick like when you lose money at a casino or you've messed up in like yeah Jumbo losing money at a casino yeah, who, who made me do that me <laughs> did, did, did you also spend his winnings on a tattoo on someone's bottom <laughs> we'll get to that um back to the story um, so that, that was like my feeling of sickness of I missed out. I don't get to be the friend of Richard because I haven't met him in Miami and hung out of him on that cool area, right? Then I met Chiro in 2019 at SEMA, right? Just got me as Brett. His name's Chiro. Oh, mate, how you doing? Had a little bit of a laugh, had a bit of banter. Never imagined that friendship would change my life. Chiro has changed my life more than any decision I've ever made in my life, yeah? And he... Through me, I introduced me. He met Richard when I introduced him, whatever. Flew out, we met Richard, got him to Petroidism Life. And on stage in front of 10,000 people, we went, Sam Hard has been one of my best friends and people I look up to for the last 10 years, and I absolutely love him. And he like declared his like friendship. And at that point, I knew I could call him a friend, is what I was trying to get to. But the main thing I've learned with networking, become friends with these people because people don't want to work with people they don't like. That's it. That is it. Full stop. Imagine if you walked into my car sales, right, and you're like, hey, mate, I'm looking for a car for my missus. Um, I'm like, all right, mate, I'll be with you in a minute. 
I said I'll be with you in a minute. Straight away you get a bad vibe. You're not going to spend the money with them, yeah? Become friends with people on like a, a, a mode they're not used to, right? Go buy them a beer. All right, there. There's a shot. Break their finger. Break break the thing. <laughs> it, look, look, it was his fault. Um, but networking is, is that. It's friendship over everything. Every single moment of my career where I've become well-known or famous in America is all because I put it all on the line. In 2015, I went to SEMA and I pretended I was famous in England. I was like, all right, I'm Sam Arn. We've got a TV show in England. Nice to meet you, right? Do you know what made me the most known person at SEMA? Is the biggest sponsor I've ever worked with called Arc Audio. We were drinking shots with Chip Vooves, Richard Rawlings, Mike Brewer getting fucked up in Elvis's suite, yeah? Looked out the window and I saw rain droplets hit in the window, yeah, in Vegas. Where it's, you see how hot it is yeah. in Vegas. So I'm the only one that put my beer down, went back to the booth, went to um, Home Depot, bought some, got a taxi to Home Depot, got some plastic sheet in, pulled all the cars in, wrapped them all up, then went back out on the piss. Then in the morning, all the owners turned up and they're like, who the fuck covered all the cars up? Was that me? And they're like, why? I said, because you spent loads of money and time doing this onto your cars and they're perfect that you don't want them ruined and I thought it was raining so I sort of did something about it. At that point, everyone knew I was a team player and that's when it all changed. That's when everyone was like, introduce you to him, introduce you to him and it is always that, let's get fucked up, let's get fucked up because you become friends with him at night, you're friends in the day. Do you remember this guy? He's a freaking legend. He broke my finger. So yes, you did break my finger, uh, which is why this hand looks like that, and this hand <laughs> looks like that. See, I think that's a loose term. I kind of broke your finger, but it was your fault. Uh, because I always stood there, and I'm normally the energetic one that runs and jumps on people and makes a dick of themselves, but this point in our relationship, you've learned to be have a bit of Sam Ard in you, or on you. That was the first time I did on the yeah. trip. And you ran and jumped on me, and I wasn't ready, to be honest. I'm not as strong as I once was. And you just took me out like an absolute... <laughs> rugby pit. It was amazing. And then it was like, bang, and Chiro was like, I hope you didn't do that on the EBC stand. I would have been really angry. I, was like, I wasn't on the EBC stand. I was being yeah, a good we, boy. We both nearly got in trouble. But, yes, uh, I did do that. You then fell over, fell up my hand, snapped my finger. But at that point, <laughs> just like you were saying about Richard Rawlins giving you his number because of that night, yeah, yeah. we had a different relationship because you broke my finger. Yeah, yeah. Not only had you broke my finger, <laughs> but also in the casino, when I was two and a half grand up off $100 or something, Oops. he told me to put it all on black and then red came in. So that is two things that happened that we'll, I will never forget. But the thing that I don't want to surpass on, because there's so many good stories in here, Sam, but we, we loosely mentioned about a minute ago that you had your own TV show back in the UK. Yeah. And we got there after having basically the story of how you still keep in the garage going, you weren't that happy, you'd had the accident, and then you'd moved yeah, on yeah, to yeah. all these different accommodations. We need to fill in that bit for me yeah, so, to so, understand oh, good point. why the Green Eyed Monster, who had a TV show that was at SEMA, okay, how, how have you got to that point? Because we need to fill in that blank. Okay. So basically, when I met Richard Rawlins, he told me a couple of things. What do you do? I was like, I'm a mechanic, I'm qualified. He's like, come work here. So I can't do that, you know, live in England. Okay, clear. Why do you do a job you hate? So, well, if there's a roof over the heads. I'm at a point now where I wasn't that person before, where I didn't have commitments. I didn't have, like, kids. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have a mortgage or whatever. It was like, when I started the business, it was like, you know what? If it fails, it fails. At this point, I'm doing all right. I'm earning money. Life's good. But I hated my life. Just like, my missus was the best thing about my life. My kids are good. My family's good. Just didn't hate. I just hated my job. A lot of the people I work with hated the job. And he was like, "Stop it." So what do you mean? He goes, Go buy some cars that you love. Sell your crap. And alongside the business that keeps the money coming in, do something you love. I was like, okay. So me and my dad started importing cars from America to the UK. Just the cars we loved. Everything we'd ever dreamed of. We'd, we'd buy one. We'd have it for a couple of months, do what we want with it, and then sell it and then trade up and get the next one. And it wasn't really a business, but it was like something called hard up garage. Because me and my dad are always broke. Hard up is that men of vision of, of oh, I ain't got no money, so I'm hard up, yeah? But my second name's hard. So it's always that, I, I always introduce it, oh, uh, I'm Sam up, as in not floppy. So like people are like, hard up, what's that about? Well, I'm hard up because I'm always broke, but my second name's hard, and I own a garage. So I had like, my Mercedes garage running here and hard up garage running here and it was great but I had this vision of I need to start filming what I do because 
it wasn't ever for monetary value. It was for the fact that when I look at my dad, who you'll meet one day, he's the most amazing guy in the world. He is like, got a big beard, long hair, like ZZ Top. Always the coolest guy ever. It's like the UK Magnus Walker. That's it. That's exactly that. You nailed it with a, with a T there. And Magnus is a guy, guy, good guy as well. And um, I'll get to that later. And um, my dad's always been like this person that I always looked up to. He's always been, don't swear, don't do this, don't do that. You know, set me on the straight and narrow. But I never knew what he looked like growing up. I didn't know how he sounded. I didn't know how he interacted with his friends, right? And when, when my kids were born, I was like, I'm going to film everything. So if I die tomorrow, they'll, he'll know how I spoke, how I was, how I drove cars, how I was funny, the friends around me, how they liked me, how they didn't like me, or how I performed, or when I was an idiot, or when I was being professional. So I started filming everything. It wasn't for monetary value. It wasn't for anything. It wasn't for ego. It was, I'm going to film this. I'm going to make videos. So I started doing it. And one of my first videos I took down off, um, I need to see if I can find it. I took down off Facebook, uh, off YouTube because I was so embarrassed by it that I had like a proper TV director that's come that's and film it. Did. My first video. And it's so embarrassing. I'm stood there with a rag in my hand. He's like, spin around your hand and look at the camera. So I'm looking like, all oh, like, and then as a, no one ever saw that weird bit, but I could just see me going, <laughs> and he was like, fucking delete. <laughs> and I it. And it was like my best viewed video on YouTube, but I just was so embarrassed. It painted a picture of me that wasn't true. And I was like, so I took it down, still got it somewhere. I'll have to send it to you and, and see if we can find it. I haven't seen that shot in about eight years of me twiddling me oily rag. Um, but I wanted to do something that I enjoyed. So I started doing that. And then I become friends with Richard. And then I started bringing cars in. And then the people that I met through buying cars go to SEMA. I was like, mate, you can come to SEMA. If you love filming shit, just come to SEMA. And then like someone saw me, it's called Slick, who turned out to be... He's never done anything wrong to me, but apparently he's a fraudster. So there's people out there that don't like him. He's never done anything wrong to me. I've been very, very fortunate to meet him. Uh, I met him at Barrett Jackson while tasering my own ass um, in front of the security. And there was this guy who was wearing a Slicks Garage t-shirt. So I've seen you on TV. He's like, yeah, owned a TV show called Highway to Sell. Become mates with him, had a few beers. And he's like, mate, I know how to get sponsors and how to talk to people. And I know everyone. I'm like, cool. So what are you doing in... in um, October, November. I was like, not a lot. He's like, I'm building a car for Seaman. Do you want to come and help? I was like, oh, I don't really have the budget. I've got family at home, work commitments. Well, two weeks before Seaman, I got a phone call. He's like, mate, is there any way if I pay for a flight, you'd fly to Miami and help me for a week building a car? I'm like, Miami. And I've got a loudspeaker. I'm missing, like, pack your fucking bags. So that night, I packed my bags and she sent me off. She said, imagine, Sam, if you had a car to deliver and a mate called you for help and you go, right? I was like, yeah. So he said, someone who you aspire to as a TV celebrity, he was a TV presenter, I was asked you to go out there and help. So I flew to Miami and I spent a week in a hundred degree heat in a workshop building a car, delivered it to SEMA, and that was the first time I told you, you know, when we were at that party, that is the car I've been representing all week, is this guy called Slick. He said, pretend you're famous, you've got a TV show in England, right? I'm like, no, he's, you've got a TV show in England, right? I said, yep. Bang. Filmed a, signed a deal, I'm under an NDA. I'm under an NDA. What's that mean? Non-disclosure agreement. You can't tell them who what the, what the show is. Can't tell them who you're working with. What network? You're on an NDA. So, shit, I didn't know that it was that easy. So then I'm in Elvis's suite with Mike Brewer in Elvis Presley's tub with Chip Foose, drinking beer, pretending I'm famous. Mike Brewer's like, who's this Brit? Who the hell is he? He's up here with all the big wigs. And I basically blagged my way in. Went up to the to the kiosk at, at um, Hi, I'm going to need my uh, credentials. I'm Sam Hart from Highlock Garage. You should have my credentials. We don't have your reservation. Well, can you find it? Ten minutes later. Reservation, pass. I'm a celebrity. I am at SEMA at 50, uh, 2015 with Steve Darnell, Chip Foods, pretending I'm on their level. And this guy, Slick, is teaching me all the same things. If a celebrity is stood next to you and you're having a normal chat, yeah? And you're like, oh my God, I need a selfie, I need a selfie, I need a selfie. It's hard, I need a selfie. The minute you get your phone out and ask for a selfie, you're a fucking douchebag. Yeah, he's, he's, he still will respect you because you're a fan, but you're never going to be on his level again. What you do is you go, mate, so, you know mate? Get us a beer. Yeah, what do you want? Put his head in. Three minutes, bring my phone over and ask to take a photo of us both. Cool, bye, bang. Brings beer over. Oh, two minutes, mate. Can't take a photo of you two together. Oh, fuck's sake. All right. Bang, back to the conversation. I have not at any point become a fanboy. I'm still on their level and I'm in there, yeah? And then at the end of the night, I'm like, let me give you my phone number. You ever need it? No, no, no. Let me give you mine and just ping it because otherwise it's America number. I've got phone numbers in my phone book, which 
blow my mind, just for that wrong, wrong reason, never ever become a fanboy. So at the Drive Tribe event that's just gone on with Richard Hammond, Ben Collins invited me to meet Richard Hammond. Well, the point where I could meet him, Matt Armstrong's here, Scott, Adam, everyone's there. And Ben's like, oh, this is Sam Hard, he's a really good guy, I drove a Reliant Robin into a port with him. Right, cool. What? But I said, look, this isn't the right setting to meet you, mate. Shook your hand, I'll see you again. He's like, cool. He's got fans trying to take autographs. You've got people that he's trying to film with. Like, there's hundreds of people over there that want a piece of him that day. He is never going to remember this, ever, at that setting, yeah? Nice to meet you. This isn't the right time to meet you. Hopefully we'll meet again. Handshake, leave it there. Walk away. It's not the right time or place. I knew that then. When you start learning when you're with these celebrities and networking, it's all about knowing where you are. Gauging. Have I had too much to drink? Gauge him. Has he had too much to drink as well? Work on that, you know? If you're, if you're fucked up, and you go meet Paul Walker's brother that you wanted to do your whole fucking life and you're drunk out your head, you're going to cry like a little bitch and then you're going to cry with him and then you're just going to ruin that opportunity of having that heartfelt moment. I wanted him, I, Paul Walker was the one person growing up which I wanted to aspire to be like. Good looking, fair hair, always cool guy, didn't do anything wrong, did stuff for charity, had a daughter, respected his family, never been arrested, all these cool things. When he died, my life kind of, fucking fell apart, I was like, he's the only celebrity I've ever given a shit about dying, and then, because of SEMA, and my networking, and the working I did with, like, C-Tech, and all these people I've been working with since 2015 to 2019, I built a car for SEMA, which gets to the TV show that I didn't get, right, turn up at SEMA, I get invited to the C-Tech party, yeah, Paul Walker's brother, Cody Walker, is there, and I'm trying to hold myself together, because I didn't drink for three hours straight at the party, because I wanted the opportunity to meet him, but he's always talking to people. So I'm like, John, it ain't right. So me and my dad start getting on the beers. Also, I took my dad to Vegas in the most crazy road trip of my life, which we'll get to. Um, and I'm there. And then by the time I'm fucking drunk out of my fucking head, I finally get to meet him. And I'm like, so when you know, I respect every part of you. Every ounce of standing up on that stage and stepping in for your brother when he's no longer with us. I'm starting to fucking well up. I said, we don't love you because you look like him. We don't love you because you act like him or you come across him in a film. We love him because your family respect what you have and the love for cars that you have and the charity work you do. And so I'll say, he'd be looking down on you, so proud right now. And the fans don't love you because you're Paul Walker's substitute. We love you because you're you. You're, you're amazing. And he starts well out. I start well out. Like, fucking hell. Wasn't supposed to be drunk at this point. Wasn't supposed to be getting emotional. It was supposed to be a professional interaction. Turned into that. And I'm in Vegas in the coolest car of my fucking life. And he walked over to my car the next day, which he promised me he would. Signed the dash and was blown away. So, ticked all my, my boxes of bucket list shit. Every day I have to make new bucket list stuff up because people like you and me keep ticking them. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That is a lot to take. Oh, in. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, it was, what year are we there? 2019. 2019. And you started hard up garage. You got the business going at home. Got yourself back on your feet a little bit after the stuff. Yeah, that yeah, happened. yeah. You discovered that by filming yourself and faking it till you make it and growing a network, which you learned how to do because of the stuff back in the day at Mercedes when people used to walk in, try to gauge them and figure out how to talk to people, which yeah. then will give you that skill there. So by just learning, 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 you've been able to develop all these skills to put you in a position. That now when you go to SEMA, you're one of the most known people there. Yeah. But what does then that do for you with all your businesses and your YouTube and where are you going with everything? What It's all well and good and those moments are fun and maybe that's what we live for. Oh, they don't pay the bills. Maybe, maybe those moments are what we live for. That SEMA week that I had with the guys, and I have to, sorry for going off on the tangent here, everybody, but you said something a minute ago which I could relate to so well, which is that final phone call, just fucking go to SEMA. I had Freddie on here who said, you need to come to SEMA, man. I then had Matt on here and said, I'm building my car. I had Chira on here, which said, you need to... And I went. And everything that Sam just explained was my experience of that when I went for the first yeah. time too. But then how have you monetized that? So I don't know my own worth. That's the truth. And, Matt and Ben Collins has made that quite clear. Chira has made that quite clear. Um, Chiro met me in 2019 and started presenting. He said, mate, like he compared all his own shows before and he's an amazing guy he talks to people about the cars his knowledge of supercars and italian stuff and italian food apparently the guy doesn't like ham or pineapple and pizza or a douchebag um but the he said look sam i want you to host a stage for me i'm like 
this is a dream come true. Like, so my fucking dream job is to stand up on stage and talk shit because I'm quite good at it, right? He's like, well, you're the only guy I've ever trusted to stand on stage and that take over my road. So, so Petrol and Ism Live are still on stage, got paid for it. I was like, my God, I've been paying to go to car shows my whole life. No idea I've been put in a hotel, food and drink. I got paid to stand on stage and having a laugh and having a feeling in my chest of finally feeling comfortable in my own skin, right? And then my YouTube started going all right, so I started building cars, but through my YouTube and filming stuff. But 2019, when I met Chiro, I, I don't know if you ever heard of a show called Fast and the Furious Live. So it was a live show where they basically had all the Fast and Furious cars they put into an arena show so that people would go there and see all these cool stunts for cars. Well, the car, the show was a flop. It was designed by car people, but not put into action by car well, people. Executed properly. Executed properly. And it just, but watching it, when you see a car do a donut five times, even as a guy that likes cars doing donuts, you get pretty bored pretty quick. I've know? seen a guy do some donuts today and cater them outside the van. He nearly went into the side of Hashtag <laughs> moist. And um, yeah, so from that point, I loved Fast and Furious growing up. So my dream car was a 970 Dodge Charger. It's like, you guys have Lamborghinis and Ferraris. My dream car was Dominic Thoreau's Fast and Furious Charger. Yeah? So I went to this auction, uh, which was on an army base just like this. And oh my god, all every Fast and Furious car I've ever dreamed of looking at. There was a tank, there was a Dodge Charger, supercars, everything. But there was a hero car, Fast and Furious 1970 Charger, with a roll cage, it was the car that Dominic Trotto drove, and it was 100 grand. And I had, didn't have a kind of money, but I had 40 grand in the bank to buy cars. So I was like, cool. So I bid in the electric Eclipse that had Tesla motors in it for five grand. I bid on another Dodge Charger that was electric, and they pressed the button, the wheels turned, and it was Tesla powered. And I bought the safe. Um, and I bought a few other bits and pieces from, from the film. And I walked over loads of change. I was like, oh my God, I just got the Dodge Charger. I bought the Oshkosh Dune truck as well. Um, that was really cool. The massive off-road eight-wheel thing. But this one had fiberglass wheels that you press the button and they turn to make it look like they went. And the hydraulic rams that made it look like it was going over rocks. Like it was 250 grand to build. I bought this cool shit for under 40 grand, right? But I got home and I lived in this little council estate flat. And I finally felt like the Asda Zone or JC Penney's version, sorry for you American guys, of Dominic Toretto. I had a little one car garage with my Dodge Charger that was electric in that looked the bee's knees, but didn't drive. It was like you press the button, it went along at five by nine, press the button, it did a hydraulic wheelie on its back wheels. It was cool as shit, right? And I was like, it's cool, I'm done, I'm done. Bucket list ticks, yeah? And the guy walked up to me after the auction, he was like, hello, um, are you Mr. Hard? I'm like, yeah. There you go, paperwork opened up. Universal Studios title logbook, V5, that this car was used in Fast and the Furious by Universal Studios. It was a hero car that had been chopped up to make a clown car out of. So I was like, oh my God, this changes everything. So I had that car, and I also at the time had a NASCAR, like an American stock car. But the stock car, I could drive on a track and was really fun and fast and stupid and mental. And this looked amazing, but I couldn't do anything with it. Either car couldn't go on the road. So what, but the title of this car could be registered. So I cut the floor out of the Dodge Charger, welded it to the NASCAR, sent it to America and drove it to SEMA in Las Vegas. And that's where I met Chiro, hence the connection with Cody Walker. So, and then I also did, drove it 1800 miles to SEMA because we drove to, flew to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I sent the car. And it was sunny, like a normal day, like not today. And we went outside and it's 10 degrees, it's all right, still coat weather. And we were like, we're gonna drive to Vegas tomorrow for the Radical Rob build-off, right? So I built the car for this build-off to SEMA. And um, going off like loads of tangents here, like, so it's gonna be the, uh, this is the world as you know it. And um, went out there and we got there. Next morning woke up, it was minus 13 degrees Celsius. Snow, six inches. I've got no wipers, no heater. I just assumed America was hot. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Geography teacher. Mr. Smith, you're a douchebag. And um, didn't realise that it was going to be snowing. So and I've got like race tyres on the lot. So me and my dad went to Walmart, bought some sleeping bags, cut holes in the bottom, and drove to Vegas in sleeping bags, me and my dad all the way to SEMA. So yeah, it took a tangent, but 
This is what I'm saying. That's how the networking works. Because if it wasn't for 2015, me helping that sponsor out, I wouldn't have the place at SEMA. If it wasn't for me networking in SEMA in 16 and learning how to speak to sponsors, I wouldn't know how to get free shit to build the car that got me to SEMA in 2019, which then gets recognized by your celebrity friends like Cody Walker, Richard Rawlins, Elo, Chip Foose, all come and check my car out and realize I was a car builder. I built it in England and I drove it to SEMA to show off the place of the products that they gave me and then I got a reputation for being this crazy car guy in England that built a car out of two American cars brought them back to an America and then had the American dream of driving across America but in England did you still have that garage yeah still then, had it so who who makes that work when you're not there my staff but it didn't work it did not work and then what happened in 2020 when lockdown had so so 2019 when I took that car to Vegas my dream car, my Dominic Toretto Charger, took it to Vegas. Signed a contract with a production company. Big production company flew to, flew me to LA, did a pre-video, promised me a house in Dallas, Texas, promised me my own show, promised me money, promised me my wife and kids visas, the lot. After SEMA, sorry, after SEMA, we come back, and I'm all buzzing like my, I just performed the most amazing magic trick of the world. I built a car in England, took it to Vegas, got the respect of all my peers, yeah? Got the phone call, the director nearly died, got COVID, production shutting down, we're not filming TV shows, got COVID. But we all knew we had COVID, we were all ill after SEMA, but no one had heard of COVID. The, the contract got squashed because it says under worldly reasons or whatever, like acts of God. Oh, worldly reasons, yeah. yeah. Um, so a contract got squashed, so I was, I've given my garage at this point to someone else. So I've given my garage to one of my employees, he's taken over, I've rented it to him, I'm going to go do a production in America, I'm excited, I'm fucked. I fly back to England and I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, well, I'm screwed, you know, so a couple of, but it went about six weeks after SEMA, where it all kind of really hit home, then COVID hit, and we're like, what are we going to do? And a friend of mine's like, hey, I've got a car sales, COVID's here, I'm gonna get rid of it. Are you interested? It's like, I ain't a fucking car salesman, I'm a TV presenter. I wanna be a TV presenter. And it took the biggest kick in the balls. I was embarrassed once again in my life. I felt embarrassed. Like, I've gone from hanging around with these people, hopefully gonna be on the same level in a TV career. I'm gonna be a presenter, I'm gonna be a YouTuber, I'm doing everything to a fucking car salesman, which not a lot of people like, or they've had a bad reputation of car salesman. What am I gonna fucking do? So for about six months, I shut myself off to the world. I was like, selling cars started doing really well, turned over 1.3 million in the first year in lockdown, which is unheard of. I um, started off with 20 grand. So Richie Sunak and, um, what's his name, blonde haired dude, it was Boris Johnson. Those two people, people may hate them, but without them two people wouldn't, be sat here right now with you with the, the last because they gave me two 10 grand business grants with those two 10 grand bar grants i spent 15 grand on a larry air-conditioned office i spent three grand lifting it up and a disabled ramp in because i wanted it to look larry from the road i spent two grand on stock four cars for 500 quid put the money back in put the money back in put the money back in nowadays i've got 350 grand's worth of stock and i change it every single month bang 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 and i built something that I wasn't embarrassed of anymore. I, I've built something pretty special here. Can finally buy a nice watch. Finally buy Ugg boots that people take the piss out of me. I can finally buy the stuff I love. And I've actually got a bit of money to start filming, get a production company in and film some stuff and do my own YouTube. I haven't got a TV career, but do you know what? I can goddamn film it myself. So I started doing a podcast, kind of like a in, in my office in the middle of lockdown, just me and Chiro. And Chiro's like, why do you invite me? I said, because you're a fucking nice guy and people will love you. Let's have a chat. Then we invited like Freddie Tavares. And I invited Richard Rawlins on it. I invited everyone on it, like remotely all around the world in lockdown, giving people a little bit of inspiration. We had no views, like 100 views, 200 views. You can go through like interviews now online and look at them. And we had fun, right? And I realized that the car sales isn't anything to be embarrassed by. That is the, the thing that is gonna afford me to go to America moving forward. It's gonna afford me to do my videos. It's gonna afford me to act like Charlie Big Potatoes and come out and schmooze with Dynaco, right? And all these have these amazing things because that company there uh, allows me to do it. And then I was like, do you know what? I can integrate my car sales into my videos and still have these American crazy cars. 
which I was doing, and I haven't stopped, I haven't given up. And that's why everyone in America knows me, so I went over there and I proved myself. I dedicated, I've never shit on anyone, I've never ripped anyone off, I've been shit on so many times in my life, that when you come out the other end, my dad told me one thing, doesn't matter how many times you get shit on, you never change. You have a harder skin, you know the, like, the things to look out for. If you say to me, oh, do you know what? Ben Collins is the right dickhead, yeah? I'll be like, fair enough, if that's your opinion of him. I'll meet him with a, f a complete blank mind and then realise for myself that he's a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> but, doing in bed. So, but I'll make my own decision of him, but still have it in the back of my head that someone's given me a bad vibe, but maybe they had some beef that I don't know nothing about. I met a dickhead that's actually amazing. That's what <laughs> Here I am! <laughs> and he sat in the van opposite me. So what we've gone through there is the fact oh. that when you were actually before, say, twenty pre-2019, yeah. your, your Mercedes garage at home that it was run by employees and putting together was, I say just about, it wasn't really funding you being in a way and doing all these crazy shit. No. And then what you came to learn is, right, I was wondering, right, I've got to build a fucking business about the stuff that I love, the stuff that I don't, and now that's come to realise and that's something for the viewers to take in, that that business does fund a lot of the stuff that yeah. you're now doing, but that stuff is also now starting to fund itself yeah. and becoming into hard up garage as a brand, yeah. not just a place. And that's how we'll get to SEMA, and this is the first year I've ever made any money on like big time. Like SEMA's always paid for itself for the last couple of years. Like, do you know what? I no longer need this. Uh, but we get to SEMA 2020. Okay. We're here. So SEMA 2020, I'm finally starting to, uh, no, 20 and 21, we couldn't go. To SEMA. So 22, we could go back because we were allowed back in after COVID. Um, and it was weird. It was awkward. It wasn't, it was still networking, still having a good time, still getting fucked up every night. But it, it was awkward because some of the biggest brands weren't there, like Ford, Dodge, pulling out because there was no COVID had really put them in a tight bind. And it wasn't the same feeling. Um, and I still, the life and soul of the party, still made money, still covered my sponsor. So what you do is you get work of a sponsor, and when you come well known, you go on their booth and you just talk about their brand, you have a laugh with people, you bounce, you have some fun, and you film, and you get your camera out, and you just walk around like you're a celebrity, and they pay you to do it, and it covers your flights and your hotel, but it never puts any money in your pocket, it just makes it a free trip. But my car sales was earning me enough money to sort of subsidize my spending money a little bit. And then Chiro and Ben Collins, taught me my own worth a little bit. Like, Sam, you're networking people for nothing. You helped me build out for nothing. That slapped me in the face when we were over there. Yeah, it, it, and I know everyone. Like, I know SEMA, I know the VPs of SEMA, I know the, the camera guys, I know everyone. Which, if I could just interject on that, just for those people that may be watching that just keep thinking, okay, SEMA, it sounds great. Can you just paint a short picture of what SEMA is in your own words? Okay, so let's say whatever you're into, whether it's building, uh, commerce, accounting, whatever, right? Imagine going to the biggest convention you've ever been to in your life, right? But it be a thousand times bigger than you've ever seen. You can walk for five days straight from seven in the morning till seven at night, still not see everything, miss everything you want to see, and see the biggest celebrities of your realm there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So SEMA for automotive people, is every single platform from China is worldwide inclusive, different halls, different brands, different stuff, from a gear knob to a rubber that goes on a brake pedal to tires to fuel. Everything is there. It's automotive is there. But also all your TV guys are there. All your celebrities are just walking around because they're getting brands. They're doing sponsored deals, whatever. They're networking. But you can't turn up as a member of public until Friday. Only the last two years because COVID killed them that they opened the doors to public because they're like, everyone wants to come. This is, an un, this is a lost revenue stream. But it's not public public, is it? No, it's, it, yes, it is. It's public public. Okay. So public can come in, spend $100 and go around SEMA, which is the biggest show in the world. You're never going to see it all in one day, but it's open to public now. Um, but it's mind-blowing. And it's not just the daytime. And you can never prepare yourself. This is the one thing I've learned the most at SEMA. If someone said to me once, Wear a pair of shoes and an outfit you feel comfortable in photos, walking around in and representing yourself in, and partying like a fucker in, right? Because what will happen is you'll be stood there with Richard Rawlings or someone having a chat, and someone will go, we're going to Elvis this week, you coming? 
you don't have a chance to go back to your room and get changed. You don't get a chance to freshen up. All these people have been there all day as well. You go to that together as a syndicate and you go get fucked up and you go network in a room which you never would have been invited to unless you were there at that point in that moment. And what you just explained there is exactly how I felt going into that as well. I remember walking around all day being knackered and we ended up in a bar and the next minute we were on the most private golf estate in Vegas yep. at the C-Tech Chargers yep. party and just everybody was And all there. because I met C-Tech years ago, I was like, I want to invite some people that I think are going to be beneficial for the brand. I will never, ever put my reputation on the line for someone I don't care about and trust or will also not be beneficial for them, yeah? So every single person out of everyone I invited to that party, and there was probably 20 of us there that I invited, all the Motralics guys, Chira, everyone, I said, I have 20 people I need to invite. And they're like, cool, we trust you. But on the same hand, those 20 people I brought, each of them had something to offer, CTEC, and CTEC had something to offer for them. It wasn't, I was just inviting my mates on a piss up for a free round. That's not how it works. And when um, Carl Vertical contacted me and said, hey, um, would you be interested in doing some videos at SEMA? I was like, yeah, didn't know how to negotiate my worth to them. So I told them a certain price. We agreed on a price for video. So I was going to do four videos at SEMA. And then I got a phone call from someone. I said, hey, man, are you coming to the Carl Vertical party? He was like, I don't fucking know. I haven't been invited. I, I know I'm working for them. Haven't got an invite. And I get a phone call from Carl Vertical saying, hey, we want to do a party in Vegas. Um, do you have any ideas? I was like, yeah. So I've been to parties since 2015. I'll put the best party on you've ever had. It was the best party I've ever been to. And they're like, okay, cool. What do you want? I was like, I need some money. So I wrote a figure out. And they were like, okay. So I said then, I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Chiro, I'm going to need some help. I did someone with event planning. I know how to get every celebrity in Vegas to a party to a company they've never heard of. I also know how to build a vibe and an element of, you know, how different C-Tech party was, where it's cocktail party compared to a party where you're getting on the beers and enjoying yourself and free. In a sophisticated environment. Exactly. Well. So what I did was I went, they were like, oh, what we want to do is we want to have photos and videos of people walking through the door. I was like, nope. I'm like, okay, so because the celebrities we're going to invite... Back to the phone, Pex. Back to the phone is all about these people will want to come to this party for the next 10 years because it is a cool, calm, and relaxed environment that there aren't tourists at chewing their ankles. Also, there's not a company they've never heard of asking for photos with them and representing their brand they've never heard of. Not going to work. Also, no one wants to be on video at 7 o'clock at night. They've had enough day, enough of it. They want to chill out and have a good time. And they were like, okay. Like, well, we want you to do a half an hour presentation on the brand. And I was like, I love your brand so much. I'm such a fan, but not going to happen. I'll do a 10 minute thing. And they're like, we need it in the first 10 minutes of opening. I was like, no, you don't. We do it at like half nine. Everyone's on the beers. And I said, also, I need Courtney Hansen to be there. And they're like, what does she bring to the table? I said, she's a presenter, probably one of the most famous female presenters in America. And she's a friend of mine. And I want to put some money in her pocket. And they're like, okay. What does she bring? I said, well, when you invite all these celebrities that I know, they will go, oh, okay, maybe, because it's Sam, they've known me, we're pals. But if Courtney Hansen, which is the centerpiece and that cornerstone of the community, is also going to be there working with me, two of their friends invite them, there's a more of a chance to turn up. I phone Richard Rawlings, say, hey, man, I'm putting a party on, can you turn up? I'll be there. I phone, like, Mark from Cartoons Magazine, I'm doing this, when you be there? I'll be there. I phone Shag from Freaks of Nature, I'll be there. Chris Jacobs turned up. Every TV celebrity at Vegas was at our party. And because I made it also very European, they're like, what do you want to do? We'll give people a free drink. I was like, no, no. We need to have people walk through the door and you hand them 10 free drinks tokens and you tell them there's no tipping. America is a tipping society. We're not tipping. We've already paid the tip to all the staff. There's no tipping. So when you walk in, when you walk to any private event and you walk in, you're like, oh, are the drinks free? Are the... It's the food free. Well, I don't really feel like I fit in. This is all good. I wanted you to walk in. Here's your free drinks. Anything. Bar's yours. Enjoy yourself. No photos. No bullshit. No stress. No aggro. When everyone's having a few beers, I get up on stage like, Carl Vertical is this, 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 and this, and this. It's not about what Carl Vertical can do for you. It's what you can do for Carl Vertical. How you can work together. How you can make money. Bang, bang, bang. A 10-minute presentation. Then I got drunk. But for as confident as you are, yeah. And for as fucking good as that night was, yeah. which it was, the next day, and this is what's so good about spending time with people is you can reflect on things. 
you said to me when we were sat down, I can't fucking believe that all come together. Yeah. So there's still in the the, element even of though that's the front engine, yeah. of all the excitement, all the fun, everything. Deep down inside you, how worried were you? I oh, horrendous shit myself. So you heard of Tim Shaw from Car SOS? Yes. So I met him, Petroidism Live. I presented Petroidism Live two times in a row. Three times now, I can't remember. Um, then I've done the British Motor Show on stage with Chiro. I've presented stages to some pretty big names and I've done some pretty good jobs here, right? But presenting on stunt a stage of people you don't care about, like, or no, like you have no invested interest in the public at that point. You're just talking to crowds that either want to hear or they don't and you hope they react in a good way. When you're stood in front of people that you hope the next 20 years of your career they'll appreciate you and respect you is a whole new ball game. Especially like Richard Rawlings is watching, Chip Boost is watching. All these freaking celebs are watching me represent a brand at a party they've never been to. And I've got to get it across in a professional way that five of the guys from Carl Vertical are watching me to make sure I tick all these boxes, yeah? I've got to do it in a fun way, in a quick way that gets out of the way, but everyone's still, oh my God, that's what Carl Vertical's about. Oh my God, I might be able to earn some money out of these people. How can I work with them? How can I bring that brand to my channel, yeah? I nailed every element of it in such a way because I didn't drink. Yeah, I didn't drink all day. Didn't have a drink all day. And I said to them, I'll have one beer before I start, bang. And then I was there for three hours networking, introducing people, da 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 da. And then I nailed it. Turn around the car vertical, you happy? Amazing. Like, best night ever. They gave me my own carbon fiber um, watch as a gift, as an appreciation. Um, and the relationship will hopefully be there forever because they took my advice. Lots of brands out there will go, this is what we want, this is it. You're in or you're in. I told them the only way to make any kind of respect for you at SEMA is to tick these boxes. And they believed in me. And it's like they went in and did you. They put all on black. And it's either going to come in or it ain't. And it came in for them because they now have a network of groups. But... My value, I charged them as a presenter. I didn't charge them any money in relation to putting the party on. They put the money in the pot and we spent the money everywhere to make it work. Went halves with Chiro, we went, you know, and then Chiro did it for free, just to help me as a friend, because he knew I had to deliver. At the end of the event, they phoned Chiro and was like, we need to pay you. And that is the respect I have for Car Vertical, because they, they understand when, when money is needed or appreciation is needed, they give it every step of the way. And that is the most important thing. I will work with people that I love, I care about, and I trust. That's it. And what we're going to touch on, because we were explaining how SEMA, and what SEMA is, yeah, which yeah. I think people now have got a good understanding of what SEMA actually is. But all of this stuff to people, especially with how energetic you are, if, so anyone listening is going, whoa, that's yeah. the reaction of the listeners. Right yeah, yeah. This is a lot. However, I do know... I've come to know you a little bit. That I've seen, I've spent a week with you. I've seen, I've seen the positivity. I've seen the energy, but I've also seen a little bit of the anxiousness. A yeah, little yeah. Bit of the, the whole Sam a little bit. Mm. If you just blank your mind out for a minute on a whiteboard with a pen, where's the scale of you as a risk taker? Because everything we spoke about says that you're always taking the biggest risk. You're just willing to put everything. Don't matter about anything on the line. Would you say that that's correct? Or would you say that realistically there is a little bit of you do actually take things step by step, whereas just everything a risk? No, so not everything is a risk. Things that I have my heart in, or I believe, or I have a feeling, like a tingle in my chest. Like when I met you, I had this feeling and vibe about you that you're just so fun to be around. Like, I don't know if it, a little bit of me projects to people because everyone walks away from SEMA with salmonisms like where I, I say this hello and welcome in and around the mouth hashtag Mike cash your number four please um I have these things about me which blend into people and I fall in love with aspects of humans and the love for them like when I met Ben Collins um it was in a car park at Petra and his underground and he walked up to me this other guy walked up to him who I didn't know very well he's like oh it's Ben Collins like, oh nice to meet you um, whatever I'm presenting and so says, okay, cool, blah, 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 start chatting. So, recognise him, recognise him. That fucking Ben Collins, that bastard, he's like, how you doing, you lovely man? Give him a hug, the love of him. Bounced off, I was like, let me introduce you to, or to Alex, let me introduce you to Tavarish and Chiro. So then I am introducing Ben Collins, who I've known for three seconds, to other people. 
because I trust that he's a good person. I've never seen anything bad in the press of him, and I respect his integrity to, to go out and put himself out there when it could have all been over, you know, could have been game over. And me and him have sort of become good friends to the point where he's like, Sam, you have a worth, and we need to turn your confidence and how good you are into monetary value. That's the bit that people don't see. When we're taught, we, we at SEMA collectively, me, myself, Ben Collins, uh, Chir, we all spoke and we're all talking about you behind your back when we were oh, at shit. the bar the lot <laughs> and we were saying, he has no fucking idea what his worth is. But this is when I come back to yep. the real Sam of how much of a risk taker you yeah, yeah, yeah. have to say between naught and 10, where would you put yourself? Probably an eight or nine. Because there is that element of, I do see you go, I can't balls deep in here. I don't know if it's going to work. I am a bit worried. But fuck it. Yeah. And that is the that's the kind of where I where I get but has that ever I'll tell you worked? I'll tell you one cent yeah, it's not worked a lot. <laughs> uh oh, yeah, we can go down that road in a minute. I mean the best thing I've learned, which Tim Shaw before I went to SEMA said, In the morning, mate, everyone's gonna wake up and no one wanna give a fuck. He says, I go to shows, I swear, I joke, I have a laugh, but I do the best I could do at the best point. I represent the brand right, I tick all the boxes right, and I deliver everything I promise to do. If I upset someone, no one's gonna remember in the morning. And I think that is the way I went into that car vertical party, is this is the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I'm gonna go in with so much confidence and so much fun. The car vertical are either gonna go, fucking hell, right, he's fucked up, right? Or, my God, how are we not paying her enough money? What an that? Yeah, he, he, their words to me were, I'll take it, our bills are going up next year. I was like, oh yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, because they realised at that point that I delivered on every part that I said I'd do. But there are points where I have trusted the wrong people and I've lost money and I've mentally been scarred. And I think that's the worst thing about it. People, men, are scared about talking about mental health. I'm telling you, my mental health, I've been crying my eyes out on my driveway before I go in my house so my kids don't see me upset because I've lost money or I've made a decision that I should have taken people's advice for. And what I do is I take everyone's advice and people get pissed off when I don't go with their advice. I take 10 people's advice and then throw mine in there and I, and I kind of do a bit of Sam with these ideas, you know what I mean? So they either pay off 99% of the time, they pay off really well, but sometimes like, I fuck up. I leave my missus and kids at home for months on end, not seeing them growing up properly because I'm believing in a dream which they also believe in because they let me disappear around the world and meet my my fans and achieve my dreams while my missus dreams and her aspirations get put on hold because I'm achieving mine. That's the biggest fuck up I think I've ever made in life is not seeing my kids enough growing up and not being around for her enough so like that's the thing you sit back and go, fucking hell, I did miss that, and I did miss this, and I didn't bring enough money home because the money I was spending on myself gallivanting around the world was the money it should have been on. I always put a roof over their heads and fed them the food on the table, but they, they could add nicer things or a better car or this, but nowadays I'm trying to... I realise that all the hard work I've been putting in has finally put the roof over the head, finally put her in a car that the kids are safe in, finally given her the stuff she wants, but I have taken some big fucking sacrifices, monetary wise and family wise, for it. It doesn't all just. You've begged, borrowed, and still. Yeah. Away. And I've missed out on years of my kids' life through seeing them in the mornings to a month. I built a car for the CIA and the NSA in America. I got ZZ, ZZ Top, drove it on stage, and I was away from my, my kids for six weeks. Yeah? The owner of the company that put that job on my table treated me like a fucking piece of shit made me belittle me he was an army guy from america he had best intentions of making money for charity he was a horrible person i had six months of my life being treated like six weeks of my life being treated like fucking shit even though i called in all the favors from my sponsors to build a car for kids that their parents had done the most unthinkable thing and, and passed away right because i believed in a charity this guy was a dick right until the last day like, he told me that if I didn't help out every step of the way, he wouldn't pay for my return flight back home, so I couldn't leave. Treated me like a child, showered at me, screamed in my face. But on the same hand, I got to meet Billy Gibbons and hang out with him as a pal, got his phone number on my phone. I got to meet people along the way that were positives. 
But then I fucked up and I left my missus for six weeks, which was the biggest mistake I've ever made. So I fucked up. It's the biggest mistake I've ever made. So she's seen me spend time away from the family. She's seen me become friends with all these celebrities. She's seen me do all this cool shit. She never, she doesn't really get a chance to watch my videos because she hears my voice enough as ears. I fuck it <laughs> out. And um, in Vegas, I'm walking down the road in the strip and people after people, Sam, what are you doing? Give me a hug, we're walking down this bit. We're in this casino and this guy goes, Sam, what you crazy bastard? How you doing? Gives me a hug. Like, Everyone in Vegas knows me. We're going into places and I'm front of the queue as a queue of people. It's like, Sam, you're in. Bang, in. Like, because I'm... I... Do you worry what her perspective would be about that? If that was a bit overwhelming or... Not really, because she knows I'm an eccentric bastard and she's quite... And she into that. Yeah. Most but definitely. She's opposite to me. She doesn't like my country music. She... We're not into the same stuff at all. She likes cars, which is cool, but we're not... We're not at all. She's not out there and crazy and nuts and loud. She's quiet and refined and good with money. Fuck me. Could you imagine if that was two of you? I'd be fucking broken. Imagine that. Imagine my children. Oh, okay, they're still me. Um, but yeah. Um, but Vegas, I planned it in such a meticulous way that you've seen Vegas. You can't do everything. We did everything. Like in those four days, we drove to the middle of nowhere in a steakhouse. In a steakhouse, I drove to Vegas in 2019, and it was in the middle of nowhere, and it was amazing. We did the every single aspect of Vegas. I ticked because I knew what I was doing. But she wants to next year fly in on the Thursday, come to SEMA, and actually see me on stage, see me filming, see me working, see me networking, see that side of me. She's never seen it. Are you a different Sam Hard in SEMA 2023 to Sam Hard 2019? And if so, how different? 100%. More refined. I know when to not swear. I know I need to, before I be a dick and show off and have a laugh, I need to make sure that everyone's happy with that. Carl Vertigo, I said to him, I want to end the party. I want to end my speech with, now let's get fucked up, right? And they're like, cool, right? But I knew that I could be me at the end so that whole 10 minutes was professional me the end now who's having a good time yeah who's having a good time yeah now let's get fucked up bang then that set the the rhythm we had to pay an extra hour to the venue because people at 12 o'clock wanted more you know and at that point you've got to know when to be full sam or do you watch brooklyn 99 yes to go full boil or not do you know what I mean so it it was that element of SEMA this year is like Richard's my mate he's my fucking friend who I phones me tomorrow I'll be on a flight to help him like I fucking love him like a family his mate Big Chris one of the loveliest people I've ever met in the fucking world right (laughs) (laughs) and up there (laughs) and so I didn't know if you were talking about the K-Room outside like listen to Chris Big Chris for a reason not because he's tiny and um he, I met him after Richard, and he turns out he's best friends. He's the gumball, cannibal, gum, cannibal, gumball together, whatever. And yeah, you know, I become friends with him. And um, when you're at SEMA, and Richard goes, I was like, can I get an interview with you on the test roster in your trucks? He's like, yeah, I'll be there at nine. And he's there for you. And he tells other people to go away while he does an interview with you. It's quite surreal. Is American culture different to ours in that respect? Then do you find that people hold their word a lot more in America? You spend so much time there. I think if they know you, I, I think I'm very lucky because of our accent. You know, there's there's hundreds of people that want to become friends with Richard Rollins. Thousands, hundreds of thousands English of English accent does stand out. English, it stands me out. My silly hair, I used to have bleach blonde hair for, for two years, which I, I miss more than anything in the world. Um, but my hair was falling out because I was bleaching it too much, so I had to stop. Um, my Ugg boots, all these little things, like people like, there's that idiot in Ugg boots. Yep, yeah, that'll be me. That's my USP, my unique selling point. Ugg, if you're here watching this, please send me some booties. Um... But I think that what you find is the Americans appreciate something different. And if you prove you're different and you're honest and you deliver, it ticks all the boxes and you'll never be forgotten, ever, you know? Can we take it away now from SEMA? There we covered loads there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I want to bring your viewers into Sam Hard at home. Sam right. Hard here in the UK. What you're doing now, that kid that grew up um, as a mechanic that was fully qualified by the age of... 19. 19. Yeah. Mercedes, had your own garage, but you're going out to the States. You're trying to make something happen. We've gone through all the motions. You did yeah, make yeah. something happen. You've had the unbelievable experiences and time overseas. Met amazing people. Got the network. Where are we 
now in terms of the UK? What is it that you're currently okay. doing? So 2019, seen a... you just bought a fucking supercar. Uh, I have at the moment, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and I also bought Snoop Dogg, Snoop DeVille. Yes. Which is quite cool. So um, I'm quite known for buying barn finds and stuff like that. Um, but the only reason I have any money in my life is because of my lovely lady, Nikki. She is the person that all of my wages go to her. She divvies it up into birthday presents, this, that, this, that, that. And then, like, if there's money left, I'll buy something cool. But she's the only reason I have any money in the world to buy supercars, right? Yeah. And I can't afford a Ferrari or Lamborghini just yet, but I bought something called Ultima Sports. And this is this can go out because we're revealing this Christmas Eve. Uh, two weeks, two weeks. Oh, it's going out in the next two weeks, so before Christmas. No, we can put it after that. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. So, publicity stunt. I'm going to break the fucking internet. Are you ready for this? So, I bought an Ultima Sports, yeah? So Stop tapping on the fucking oh, table. So excited! <laughs> and there's going to be good oh, every time you do it. I can see the comments section. Hands to the side. Please. Ricky Bobby. Uh, so I'm not in a strip club. My hands are under my bottom. Hey. I said, Ricky Bobby, you want to do my hands? <laughs> Go. We're going to sit on that. So, um, where are we at? So, Ultima. So, basically, I've been buying fake supercars for a long time. We touched on this earlier about fake F40s, Lambos, the lot. But ne I've scratched the itch. I've always been the bridesmaid, but Lam not the bride. Porgini. There we go, Lamborghini, Ferraro Rocher. That's my, that was my Ferraro <laughs> Rocher. Well, yeah, they probably had it. Um, but yeah, so finally, um, my buddy Dr David was delivering a car to a place, and um, he's like, "Look, there's an RV here." So my mate Chris was like, "Let's go check it out." Um, guy called Chris Wrigley, loveliest guy you ever met. Also, my sidekick is his son Josh Wrigley. They build cars with me. And we went and looked at this guy and he goes, I know where there's an Ultima. And I'm like, what, like a Nissan Ultima? Never seen one of them in England. No, 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 an Ultima race car. And they made eight of these cars. So these are called an Ultima Sports. So very similar to an Ultima GCR, but with a rounded off rear end. And they made eight of them. So I believe six of them, I'm probably wrong. So Lee Noble, if you can fill in the gaps, that'd be amazing. Um, but six of them were V6s and two of them were V8s. Well, the Ultima, a lot of people don't know, was the base car that they designed the McLaren F1 on. Did you know that? So the McLaren F1, the designer, took the first ever Ultima because it was the fastest product, like race car at Goodwood. It was the fastest car on the Top Gear track. It was unbelievable. And took the platform to design the McLaren F1, right? So that is quite an amazing feat that a predominantly small kit car company that ended up being a supercar company were the predecessors and the brains behind the McLaren F1. So what I did was I found this bright yellow Ultima Sports in a barn. So the, the gentleman last time used it 13 years ago and him and his son used to go to a one day a year car show at somewhere called Wickham Square. And they used to drive there, he used to walk to the petrol station, get a can of fuel, walk back two miles, put 10 quid's worth of fuel in it, take his son to a car show and then park it back up every year, yeah? 13 years ago was the last time that Jamie took that car with his dad to that car show. His dad died four years ago and the car's just sat there. But Jamie now has a, has a son, which he has promised that he'd get him to take him out in that car one day. Yeah? So, before I knew the story behind the reason why he didn't want to sell it and whatever, I was bidding him in the balls and trying to buy it as a car salesman. To the point where you realise that sentimental value and not ripping this guy off is probably hit the right way forward because my reputation is important to me. New Sam Hard. New <laughs> Sam Hard. I'm not so hard up anymore. And um, made a deal on the price. And my vision over the next month is we bought the car, we pulled it out of a barn. We got it running and driving, but it's absolutely disgusting and decrepit. We're going to get running, driving, rebuild the engine, um, have it looking amazing. And I'm going to piss Harrods off. So uh, by the time this video is out there, there's going to be a publicity stuff and Harrods are going to be angry millers, all right? They're going to be pissed. Because what I've done is Harrods had a bright yellow McLaren F1, a bright yellow P1, and another McLaren of some bright. Is it in the store? No, in, yeah, the store have Le Mans cars with their livery of Harrods on them, yeah? Let me show you a picture real quick. Someone at Harrods is a real... Fucking car. McLaren got exact the Mondo. They'll either be really happy or really angry with me, right? So they I'm gonna show you the pictures and I'll send it to you so you can put it on the screen. But this is the Harrods 
McLaren F. Yeah, the half CD. Yeah, with the green and the Harrods on it, That's right? It. Give us a minute. This is what we're on about. Right, so that is probably one of the most well-known McLaren F1s because they did a McLaren F1, then they did the P1, and then they've done a few prototypes as well. So I managed to find the details of how to come up with the stickers. And my detail lady is basically, at the moment, ripping stickers for me. And, um... <clears throat> so, Harrods, I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. Just for reference, because in that camera, I don't think okay. that will quite show. But the top one is Harrods logo. <laughs> the middle one here says Hard Ups Garage. Sam, have you taken a breath here and thought I might get sued? I've gone full boil. Cease and desist. Imagine getting a cease and desist from my YouTube channel from Harrods. So well, there's people that when they turn up to work two minutes late, they start stressing. How does this not bother well, you? Worst case scenario, my YouTube channel has got no money in it. I'm doing it on my YouTube channel. It has no monetary value. If they shut down Hard Up Garage, I will start up Hard Up Garage. Um, <laughs> but, but so what we're doing is we're going to fully livery the car and we're going to call it the McLaren F1 prototype because it is, right? We're going to livery it up in Harrods McLaren Le Mans livery and we're going to take it to London Christmas Eve at three in the morning and we're going to do a photo shoot in high vises with hard ups in Harrods livery outside Harrods in London and do a photo shoot on Christmas Eve and try not to get arrested and then then this is this is the icing on the cake which will bring everyone back into the force Christmas Day we're going to load the car up and Boxing Day we're going to take it to Jamie News House who is the guy that sold me the car I'm going to put the keys to his letterbox and he's going to take his son to that car show that he's, him and his dad, who's no longer around 13 years ago, went to for Boxing Day. You don't do things simply, do you? No, all in. Balls in. And then I bought Snoop DeVille. <laughs> so we, we are not sure yet. If anybody can reach out to Snoop Dogg that is listening, please yeah. do. Because you've bought what you believe is Snoop DeVille. So Elo from London Motor Museum, massive character, amazing hair, been an amazing guy for a pub for a long time in my life. Used to own something called London Motor Museum. I've known him. Um, he's been an amazing guy. He's had loads of stuff. And... He had London Boat Museum. Whatever happened, the museum got shut down and he went over to Miami. From then on, I don't really know what happened publicity-wise, um, but never been a bad person to me, always been amazing, and had the car mecca in England for, for car guys. London Boat Museum was amazing. Well, I reached out to him because these are all his cars rotting away in a field because basically the government has taken his cars. They're being stored in a field by someone who basically is selling his cars off because he hasn't been paid for storage. So I've been buying some of the cars up while also letting Elo know I'm buying the cars up. Um, and there was an auction a little while ago on Bonhams where the Batmobile was on there, the Mr. Bean car, all out of his museum. Um, and now this car was the one I wanted. Elo told me that this was used for a German tour back in the day, which if Snoop D-O-double-G could, uh, probably the most English pronunciation of Mr. Snoop Dogg ever, um, could confirm it's your car. We will do everything within our power to get it back to him, you know, and apparently every time he was in London, he used it as well. It's full hydraulics. Um, he's using a German tool, so it's got the German flag on the bonnet. Snoop Dogg livery, apparently it's signed on one of the seats, but the mould and the mildew, as you'll see in the pictures, is horrendous. It's probably gone. Um, but if it is his car and we can have any kind of just thumbs up from his PR team or whatever, we will get that car running. And driving it owes me an amount of money which I'm more than happy to disclose with him and his PR team I want to get it running and driving I want to get it hopping and I would love to if I could get my money back by shipping it to Miami I'd love to go down the road with Miami with Snoop Dogg it's a dream like I say but if you don't aim for the stars you're not gonna hit the mud on the way down or the clouds you know if if it turns out to be his car and he has any invested interest whatsoever I'll build the car, I'll finish it, I'll deliver it to Vegas next year to SEMA. I'll take it to LA, we'll drive down LA, we'll have some fun there. I'll take it to SEMA, I'll put it on show if we can find a sponsor. 
and if Snoop Dogg wants it back and covers the costs, he can just have it. I'm, I'm not into money doesn't bother me. I don't give a shit about the money. Imagine having that. Imagine turning up to LA, meeting Snoop Dogg, taking him out in his car that he went in 20 years ago and handing over the keys and just covering my costs. Like, imagine that. I know the answer to this already. Go fuck yourself. If <laughs> you could have, uh, if you lost it all, all again, yeah. everything, the brand, the lot, and someone offered you 100 grand to start it all again in a pot, yeah. but you also have to start your contact book again. Yeah. Or 10 of the people in your contact book, which would you take? Churro. Up there. Right. Changed my life. Richard. Ben Fowler. Um, so we got one free. Chiro, Richard, Ben. Just because you're here. Got to be careful. The other Ben. Um, <laughs> family and stuff are all sticking around, right? So it's just people in the contact I said, book. Would you take your contact book or would you take the money? Oh, okay. Contact always. Don't care about money. Because that, I actually couldn't believe when you were talking about where you opened the car dealership. Before we skirted over that it had done one point Three million in a year. In a year. You mentioned that you'd only actually spent two grand on stock, and yeah. the rest of it was all of the healthy image, all yeah. about making it look as good as it could what possibly look be. Kind of French trying ones. to make it look like somebody it wasn't, yep. which is a bit of a theme yeah. running throughout this podcast. Take it to you, make it, baby. And it would hit me that that network and everything that you've built up now it would be quite difficult to replicate. 100%. million again. So I'm not shocked that that is the answer that you gave. But I think we've covered off an amazing story today from start to to finish with loads of individual amazing topics that I want to touch on again when you sit back in this van for okay. another period of time but that story of how and why a network is so important in the automotive space and how you come from being very hard up to maybe still hard up garage but in a different way with a few quid in your pocket the next time I talk to you it might be the first podcast I don't have to do in the back of the van because you might be in a Ooh. jail cell after this Harrods event <laughs> or it might be in another van somewhere else which again I can't disclose but will be I like that soon before you end can I ask you one thing yes has there anything you've taken away from our relationship that you will use in the future Within four days of being um, at SEMA, because he wasn't there immediately, I met uh, Ben Collins. Yep. And I'd already seen how you interacted with different people and celebrities and people yep. who were very well known at SEMA. And when I met Ben, I knew full well that um, one of my agents that reaches out to people for the podcast to try to be in touch with him. Yep. And only through a short period of time of knowing you, I approached how I spoke to Ben totally different then yep. when he got to that and within an hour I was walking around the show with him for the entire day because yep. he wanted to be my mate that night I was dressed as an orange Nemo in the back <laughs> of a cab sat next to Ben Collins the Stig who I've watched growing up as a child heading to Fremont Street in Las Vegas when we got back within two days because he trusted me and the way I approached him the way I spoke to him which was down to me and myself meeting you at SEMA, yep. we recorded a podcast. That podcast, probably at the time we're going out now, because we're very close, is over 2 million wow. views on YouTube. And it's one of the biggest podcasts ever done in the automotive space. That is what I took away from knowing Sam Harden. That is why I want to thank you for coming on Road to no, uh, That is amazing, mate. And thank you so much. Thank you for letting me talk shit for however long it's been. And you know, I hope if someone gets... One little piece of advice out of this, uh, me rabbiting on for ages, on take one thing away from it, is don't worry about the money. That will follow later on. And stop tapping the fucking table, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>